Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of Off the Court. I am your host tonight. We have a very special two guests tonight. We are joined by the one and only Chris McGowan is my co-host. Chris, <laughs> thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, I'm really excited to be part of the conversation, uh, albeit uh, a small part of the conversation. Mostly, I'm just glad for the chance to get to spend time talking with you two. So um, I'm really glad to be here. Absolutely. We've been looking forward to this and we're so grateful for our, all of you guys that have joined us in the past episodes. If you missed any of those, they're all on GMS Plus in the archives. We've cut them up for little clips for you guys. And when we're at coaching clinics throughout the year, we get so many questions on optimizing for every age. How do we, tr how do we create practices? What kind of drills do we do? How do we make this fun for every single age, meeting athletes where they're at? And I honestly don't know if there is anyone better in the world to have this conversation with than our guest tonight, Mr. John Kessel. Um, you don't need an introduction, but we always do it. So <laughs> basically, John just does everything. I was looking through his bio. I'm like, this is really hard to, to wind down a little bit. But you were the director of development for World Para Volley for a long time, USA Volleyball with the FIVB as well. You've been the team leader on several Olympic teams. You've been in the trenches to help teams and athletes win medals. In 2013, John was inducted to the ABCA Coaches Hall of Fame, and maybe the coolest one of all, Volleyball Magazine voted him one of the top 50 most influential people in our sport in the world. So we are very grateful for your time today. John, thank you for joining. Court, I think we can't oversell John here. And, uh, you know, of the people in our sport, in the sport of volleyball. I don't think there's anybody, certainly in our country, maybe in the world, that's done more as an ambassador for the sport. And John's whole life has been about getting more people in more places in the world playing volleyball. And he's been this incredible representative of the United States of America all throughout the world. And he's been this incredible representative of the sport of volleyball and the power that it holds in athletes' lives, in people's lives. And, uh, and man, just, John, we're so appreciative of the fact that you'd spend some time with us. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for being here. I'll spend as long as you want, you know. I go back to <laughs> – I was going to put on a shirt, Reebok Gold Medal Clinic which is before it was even squared. <laughs> and that's because, you know, I was lucky enough to work with your father who was truly a guiding light and a mentor to not only Olympic, Paralympic and beach coaches, quite honestly, but also to people around the world. Your, you know, your dad, he changed my son's life as we were talking about earlier. And he, he, uh, he, his his voice still resonates. And I don't know if you, Courtney, you probably notice this better than others. Carl had mannerisms and accents and inflections that Marv Dunphy learned, that Doug Beale learned. That, I mean, it, it it's like I'm listening to a mini Carl, you know, sometimes. <laughs> he, that's the kind of impact your dad had. So I'm, I'm thankful that I'm still... Uh, giving it, you know, getting a chance to get back to the sport, even though I'm retired and doing this veteran first responder project up in the mountains where I just came down from. So, oh, and thanks to everybody here that's listening in because you're the ones on the, you know, there's the ground roots and then there's the grub roots. And GMS impacts this session is about kind of the grub roots, you know, 
below the grassroots level. We're down to <laughs> the dirt. You know? That's right. Getting after it. We've uh, It's been so fun for us to get to work with all these coaches across the country, as you have. And on that note, John, you've been such an advocate for our sport and making sure, doing everything you can to help every kid have the best experience possible. So can you just talk a little bit about why that's been so meaningful to you and this idea of growing the game? Well, yeah, that's a great question, Court. You know, for me, um, if you ask a kid, it, here's the volleyball math. Two kids or four kids, because we'll play doubles, four kids in a volleyball, and what do they do? They'll play. Four kids, a volleyball, and an adult, and what starts to happen? They start to drill. And so when I'm in a grub root level, I'm coming at it from an eight-year-old's eyes or a 12-year-old's eyes who is stepping into the gym probably fearfully because volleyball is a hard sport to learn. You know, you can't hang on to it and look around and then solve the problem later. You got to rebound it, whether you're an Olympian or you're a 10 year old, you got to rebound the ball. You can't, some coaches solve it by catching and throwing, but that just slows their learning down. We, I don't encourage that in any way, but the, the chance to make volleyball fun, it's inherent. So I grew up and I coached in my, in the seventies, I've been coaching 52 years now. Wow. So I grew up where you had the motto of if you, if you can't pass, you can't hit. Hi, I'm a volleyball coach. And you get your first hour of volleyball, forearm passing. And I still see to this day, the kids who after they pass like three or four balls, they turn around and they're rubbing their arms. And they're, I've even seen them crying, not looking at the, the coach who might have thrown on the ball. Instead, they're turning away and looking, walking away, and they're crying because it hurts. <laughs> I mean, th th this ball, usually in most nations, it's an uh, adult ball. They don't you know, have the chance to go into these modifications of lighter balls. Uh, they're just glad to have a ball in most nations. They'll use a soccer ball to play if they can because they just can't get a volleyball. And I would ask anybody listening tonight um, to simply flip it around and say, what is, what is the most fun thing in our sport? And the answer is spiking. And so you say, hi, I'm a volleyball coach. This thing here is called a three meter line. And there's a set called a BIC. It happens to be, I know you're only 12, but this, is, this BIC is an Olympic set. It's a great set. And we're going to hit it today. We're all going to hit some BICs. And the way you do it is you have a friend, so that'll be Courtney, and um, Courtney has the ball, and she throws it to me, and I go slap or ball superhero. I just put it up to you, Courtney, and you're 12, and you've never played, so you kind of slap it up to me, and then I hit it. Now, I know to do this superhero, superhero spike, because it was demoed by um chris and his dad and they show me this i slap it you slap it back and it goes up a certain height and i run up and i swat at it and if you do that for the first 20 minutes of a boy's or a girl's life they're gonna they, they're gonna whiff a few and they may not set anything near their friend but if you compact it down and set a low ball, not a high ball, they're really hard to set high balls. Let's ask you, you're an Olympic setter. What's the hardest set to set accurately? My understanding, my experience as a setter, it's the high outside of the pin. You know, it's just these other things are more condensed and closer and easier to figure out in time. So you walk into a class and you put up a ribbon because the other limitation around the world is the net. And the net is part of volleying the ball. It happens to go over it on a serve and over it on a third hit spike and sometimes over it all the other times. But that said, what I, I want to experience as a kid is the chance to hit it over this net. And I can't do it probably off a serve. No way. A serve, serve reception, that's a... That's a war that comes 
later, like in a week after they're already hooked. Uh, I've never heard that described as a war, but I really like it. It is. It, <laughs> it is. feels accurate. <laughs> and there is nothing more important, coaches. As a setter, she can tell you when she sees her team losing the serve, serve, receive battle, she has a huge load because she has to get to the imperfect serve receives and and better the ball and that is what courtney did if you have never watched her watch her on youtube she bettered the ball better than just about anybody in the world by getting to it in some way and delivering a hittable ball it wasn't the play set that they might have wanted but it was set by a setter because she read the pass and got to it so yeah you gotta win that war or else you're toast and that's at the Olympic level. That's why jumpers are so crucial and the high speed floaters, the clean floaters you're seeing in the national teams, those things disrupt the serve reception. At 12 or 10, if the ball gets over the net, they don't know where to go. <laughs> they don't know how to pass yet. And so the game isn't very fun, except the problem that I'm going to share this the solution is simply play a lot of doubles you see if you have a normal court you only have about nine meters of net span and maybe you can play a couple games of four on four or something with your team of uh, you know 12 or three on three on three on three the way you kids learn is by doing the way humans learn is by doing it. You, you got to do it. And people say, oh, no, you, you, you learn so much by watching. But the motor skill, the skill that your dad taught us to understand, the doing skill only happens if you do it. And my best example that I tell happens all over the world. Do you have a kid who's learning to drive or has recently learned to drive? Yes. They've watched you drive for 16 years. When they step behind the wheel, do they know how to drive? And every parent, you know, who's put their foot through the floorboard trying to brake for their kid or whatever and clenched, <laughs> everyone knows they don't know how to drive. And your insurance rates say they don't know how to drive. But they've been watching me drive for 16 years, but they don't know how to drive. It's a motor program. You learn a motor program by doing it. That's why reps are priceless and they need to be game-like reps. I can rip off a million against the wall, but I'm not going to know how to serve receive. I have to serve receive by seeing someone serve and reading the serve coming over the net. That's serve receive. I, I find a huge problem in our country that we develop kids who are very good passers back and forth and back to where it came from type mm. pair things. And then they go in front of their parents at 12 or 13 and in their first tournament to serve, receive, and they go, that was mine, that was mine. <laughs> or they send it back over the net. And if, if you've ever watched beginning volleyball, it looks like tennis. It doesn't look like volleyball. It's back and forth, <laughs> back, not three hits. Why? Well, because I did a thousand balls against the wall which teaches me my doing experience is I'm doing it straight back to where it came from. So that's what I've learned in my brain. And then I get a partner and I do another 5,000. And then you put me out to serve receive and I go, I don't know how to do this. I haven't served received. I know how to pass, but I don't know how to serve receive. And so doubles volleyball is the answer at any level of getting better faster because if you're the weakest serve receiver, you're going to get all the serves and you're going to get better at serve receiving. You may not win on the scoreboard, but you're going to get the reps that are going to make you better. And in six on six, I've seen kids go an entire uh, game and never touch the ball. Yeah. And so they didn't learn anything by doing. They watched. And and that's why doubles or triples or even fours, it just becomes a matter of how many reps you get in the same amount of time, that efficiency of learning in two on two. So 
what I'm asking in this GMS program is to see how you set up a ribbon or you can get four nets on one row or six nets on one long, you know, they call them long nets. You put them all up and you go down the middle of the gym. And now you've got at least four nets up that your team or your class of 20 or your team of 12 can start to play two on two here and two on two here and two on two over here. And yeah, that the gym courts aren't the right size, you know, they're not full size, but that's not as important as learning to read. You both know how to read. We all know that if, I, I've asked this of just about every national team coach. If you had a kid who was great at reading and not good technically, would you pick that kid over the kid that was great technically but didn't have very good reading skill? And they all go, I'll take the reader. I can teach them to play, but if they're good at reading and anticipating, and that's, that's priceless because it is priceless. But you only learn to do it over the net. You know what I mean? I mean, it's got to. It's got to come over the net. It doesn't come from the net when you play volleyball in front of your parents. Yeah. The dichotomy of my coaches expecting me to be good at these things, but we haven't practiced them enough. And in doubles or triples, you get tons of the doing reps that make you then good as you go up the pipeline. So Cody, you know, playing in the world championships is starting a couple days from now. He didn't play six on six until he was about 16. Wow. He just played twos. And Karch, I think he was about 14 when he went from playing with dad in doubles to playing sixes. And I'm going to say Misty, you know, was playing with Butch and Barbara May or mom and dad and, and either in the women's match or co-ed with her dad. She probably, she was in the Tiger program with Molly. She probably started playing sixes when she was 12. But her foundation where this gold medal square concept that's in the videos and stuff is they start young and they play twos and they learn to read. And when you're reading and you're little and yet you're being expected to go to where the ball is, even though the court's smaller and you'll you know, be more successful, that gets imprinted on your brain. Now, what Karch and Cody and Misty had as an advantage was they didn't necessarily play um, their age group. They played with men and women. And so the ball was going faster. And their brain learned the speed of faster. And then they went to play 14s. And it was like, oh, <laughs> this is pretty easy <laughs> because it's not coming fast. It's coming so slow. Yeah. And it's so readable versus these slimy adults that, you know, after they finally start to lose to you, they, they pull out all the stops. And so you learn to read at a higher speed. And then when you go down to your age group, it's much easier. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of what's in this concept in the video is of using the wall in a game like way using a, you know, uh, let me share an example. In beach and in indoors, my favorite way to warm up, which only takes about five minutes before everybody says, I'm ready. I, I can do whatever else you want, coach. I'm, I'm totally warm. It's called two versus zero. And it's in the series. And what you do is you, Courtney, you're on that side of the net. They're in Washington or no, you're, you're in Provo or wherever. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to serve over the continental divide. Serve to you. And after I serve in a real good game, do you want to put it back to where it came from to me? No. You want to put it to the setter. So after I serve, I fly underneath the net. I make a quick dash of eight, you know, four yards, three yards or whatever, but I run underneath the net and I'm your target. And then you pass it to me. And then I set you. And now the third hit needs to go where? over the continental divide again. It's gotta come over the net. Well, as soon as I set you, I look at you and I start reading and I backpedal 
to the other side of the net for you to have somebody to hit to. And as soon as you hit, you have to become my setter by moving forward to my side of the net. And at the very beginning level, they can't do it the way you could do it with, you know, anybody on the team. So you start with just overhead pass, overhead pass, overhead pass. You just work on moving and overhead passing. And then you add overhead pass and forearm passing. And then when they're more experienced, and it doesn't take too long, then they start hitting roll shots. And then they start to swing more aggressively. And you score it by how many in a row can we do as a team of two? It's two versus zero. And down the way, the other five groups on my team of 12, you know, the other 10 players in pairs, they're seeing how many in a row they can do. It's called cooperative scoring rather than competitive. And little kids, real ball control comes by doing what's called cooperative scoring, where you see how many in a row you can do without the ball hitting the floor. The ball hitting the floor is your enemy. Even in six on six. How many can you actually jump and swing at in six on six in a row? And that's cooperative scoring. And then the coach can say, mm, you got to step it up. That, you, you know, you, you've got it. Now you need to swing faster. You know, to swing harder. Or you have to use your non-dominant hand. Or you have to hit line and not angle any. Can't hit angle anymore. You got to hit the angle or cut shot or whatever. And real ball control as you do this six on six or two on two with the same rules you might say um means all of a sudden you see the scoring going up and we're doing 20 in a row and 30 in a row when we were at new mexico i remember if you could do cross court four person pepper a hundred in a row with full speed swings everybody on the team got ice cream yeah. and it took about six weeks but that was a pretty intense I oh yeah ice cream. <laughs> oh yeah and all of a sudden, you're cranking the ball and digging it on your side of the net and your pass. And nope, boom, we have real ball control. Yeah. So. Man, so many gems in here already. I just want to point out the program that John's talking about is coming out in the upcoming weeks on GMS+. Plus. There is endless amounts of videos and info on exactly what John's talking about in much more length and how we can bring these concepts to life for young kids. I was looking through the content today, just geeking out. I think um, the coaches are really going to love that. So geeking I'm out. excited. <laughs> yeah, that's easy for me, but there are approximately 2000 questions. I want to ask you from that. But okay. one of the, one of the concepts that Chris and I were talking about was this idea of like gritty kids that are willing to do difficult things in order to reach a high level. And if you've read the book Grit, there's like most people that are willing to do difficult things have built up this love for the game. And so we're always like, how can we help kids, as you're saying, find joy in this game that's really hard when you first start? Yeah. So yeah. that's part of the question. And the other part of the question is for all these coaches that are in it for the right reasons and want to do the best with a 12-year-old team or a 10-year-old team, how do you balance teaching technique to set the kid up for success and also all the ideas of then learning. Um, and how do you yeah. think about that? Yeah. Well, let's do the first one, the first one first. And, yeah. and that is, uh, I don't know how to describe but John, it. Let me, let me jump yeah. in. So one of the things I think that you pointed out a very practical thing was, you know, the fun part of volleyball is attacking. And so the willingness to do more attacking earlier without necessarily maybe having the skills to control the ball underhand or to serve it over the net, I think is a good example of a way to keep volleyball fun. You know, what, what other kinds of practical things come to mind as you think about that? Well, my, my order of learning is um, overhead pass first. That's the soup ball superhero. And, you know, at the lowest level, the, the, Volleyball game is over because the burgers are done crowd. They slap pretty well. You know, they just slap. So you slap, slap, spike. But then you start to teach technique pretty much right away. I mean, when I say ball, I'm not saying ball. I'm saying ball. And the kids learn by watching <laughs> that stuff. And so they see 
And yes, there may be some basketball players who want to put their hands up like this and then shoot because that's what they've done before volleyball. And you say, well, that's great for basketball, but you're doing a volleyball. And, you know, if you've never done it as a coach, you can demonstrate setting like this. You can set a ball big or higher with just one finger, but then you still superhero. But you want to do a ball, so you're going to do ball superhero. Then you spike. The third skill I teach is a, in the sequence and the way the videos go. We teach serving third. Still no forearm passing yet. Still no pain on the forearm yet. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're hooking them, you know. We're getting them hooked. And, you know, you'll be forearm passing in a week or whatever, just not doing it first because that's not as exciting especially for a boy but you know any good athlete likes to spike male or female so the third skill i teach is serving and i will actually teach and it, it's on the sequence series and stuff i will teach a slide jump serve to very young kids and i will teach a high torque jump serve you know the the facts are that 38% of the power in spiking and serving come from the shoulder torque and 42% comes from how fast your arm goes. Only 2% comes from what your wrist might do at the end of the kinetic chain and only 18% comes from your core. So you want kids who swing fast, which means they're gonna be inaccurate <laughs> and they're gonna lose games as a young coach, I could hear myself. I wish I had these kids back. For God's sake, just get it in. <laughs> God. You know, and so we create an entire generation of medium ball control, afraid to hit that crap out of the ball spikers because they don't want to miss. They don't want to learn to go fast first. A lot of, a lot of just arm here. Yeah. 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 And, and no, open the door, slam the door. So why do I teach the slide torque serve and a torque serve? Is because while I'm not, you know, sure I'm slightly influenced by Long Ping, you know, my sister from China, or I'm influenced by uh, my history in the Asian style. The the roundhouse, the turning serve, generates in any kid of any age, including four year olds that 38% that otherwise they don't have as they kind of just crane down or whatever. And so if you do a slide along the net and set yourself with your left hand, your brain without having to be told much says, well, I'm headed that way and the net is that way. I need to do something to get the ball over the net. So you torque. Now, certainly what and GMS does this really well, I'm demonstrating this as the coach first, maybe not even having a ball. I, I remember I was telling Susie from St. Louis, you know, I demoed, you know, she got, she comes running up, John, 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 I'm the varsity coach. I play on my husband's co-ed team and I serve underhanded. <laughs> Can you help me with an overhead serve? I said, sure, watch me. And I stood there and I said, place, and then twist and swing your arm fast, place and whip, turn, what, you know, all these things. Just see what I'm doing. Go do that. 20 seconds later, I was helping other people. And about five, maybe 10 minutes later, she came up and pounded me on the back. John, I just got 10 out of 11 over. This is fantastic. I'm so excited. I said, great, Susie, show me. And she stood there and she went, boom, sent another one over. I'm, I can't wait to play with my husband's co-ed team tonight. I burned some of these serves. They're great. And so, Susie, this is fantastic, but aren't you right-handed? You see, my weakness is I'm a lefty. And so I naturally demonstrated it left-handed, and she totally copied me without, you know, didn't say, oh, <laughs> oh my God. Know. You know, she just copied me and had 10 out of 11 in, you know. I'm amending my earlier comments. John Kessel <laughs> single-handedly turning half the world into left-handed servers. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> and, and, and I, 
I think I did it when I did a couple of your clinics with your pop. You know, I, I said, I want you all to serve experience being a beginner again, because you you've been coaching 10 years. You're not a beginner. But to take you back to being a beginner, I want you to serve a roundhouse, a torque serve left handed. And virtually 85 percent of them come back after just two minutes of trial and go, I got it over the net. I go, yeah, <laughs> you did that. I didn't need to talk. Now, I, can I refine your technique? Absolutely. Your timing is, are you on schedule? You know, you're on time. Are you late? You're early. Where are you placing the ball? All these things that are part of a good technique. After I get the whole thing started, then I start to refine the pieces, you might say. And they're, I'm usually refining it individually. One kid does one thing this way, another kid does it this way. Susie's case, I go, aren't you right-handed? <laughs> 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 so it was a fairly major technique change. But it, so that this jump torque, is, I demonstrate by running, holding the ball in my left hand, running along the net, along the end line, placing the ball, and then turning in the air like a, like a slide. It's what we sometimes call it the slide jump serve or a torque serve. I have 10-year-olds that can whip it over the net if they stood and did their normal crane or they stood and tried they can't but when their brain sees the nets there they just turn and hit it over the net and it goes over the net and they go ah, you know because that's what kids do when you are little and you get it over the net finally you know that's what, they go crazy yeah and that's a gift you give them because you say to them, especially the kids you like or whatever the most, you can tell if they have good attitudes and all these things like, like a Courtney, you say, okay, here's a volleyball from our team bag. I, I don't want this back until next practice, but I would like you to go against a garage door and do a lot of jump serving and do maybe some Bix and set yourself some Bix and, you know, do some practicing all by yourself or get a friend and the two of you, you know, can now do pass that hit because, and then bring the ball back. And, you know, that's what I'd like you to do. So you get more reps, but because you've given them this closed motor program of serving, which they like to get good at, which if they're a really good server, then they hit the sixth grade team or they're a really good server and they hit the seventh and eighth or ninth grade team. And you can blast a serve every coach, at any level of scholastic game goes, I want that kid. <laughs> they may not be able to play, but they can serve and they will be able to play. So I go with serve third and then within a week, you know, within two or three practices, you introduce the forearm pass exactly the way GMS does it. I, the, all the pieces of it, I, I think are exactly the, the right thing. The challenge is to maybe reorder it from hi, I'm a volleyball coach, let's hit, changed from hi, I'm a volleyball coach, if you can't pass, you can't hit, so we gotta get good at passing. Yeah. That works uh, maybe with an adult, but little kids hitting the ball off their arms are going, ow, <laughs> all the time. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah, oh, that's right. great, I've never thought of it like that. And John, we've gotten some amazing comments so far, people are fired up here. And just for all the coaches listening, if you guys have specific questions, write them in the comments and we'll be sure to throw them in as well. Sometimes I get selfish and stick with mine, but I'll try to be, I'll try to be nice tonight. There's a lot of you guys on there excited. I'll be here until midnight. There's no reason <laughs> to go anywhere. I'm flying to New York tomorrow morning and uh, doing a big clinic for an old friend of mine from CU 30 years ago that said, would you do a clinic before I retire? And Oh, that's fine. And then I'm, you know, getting there at 10 o'clock at night and leaving it Sunday at 6 a.m. And all I'm going to be is in the gym and then going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I think I know the answer to this. I think I know what you're going to say. But how do you we get often get asked what age should kids choose a position and how would you kind of help parents and kids think about that in an ideal situation? Yeah. Well, um, there's two things. First, I'm going to help all coaches because of what Courtney just said. So there's some words that I uh, strongly encourage you to get rid of in your vocabulary when you're helping kids of any age. And it kind of goes back to the thing, Courtney, for a second. I'm going to even go a little bit further. I didn't finish the thought. And that is, 
how do you get these kids to have grit? That was your kind of big picture question. You get it by making your gym a safe place to screw up. Olympic or 10-year-old? Bill Neville calls it an exploratorium. I say to just about every camp I do, hi, I'm John. This is where we're going to learn. And I want you to know the most important thing is I want you to make mistakes. Because I don't want you to do what you're already good at. While we're together, I want you to press your envelope and do things you are never done or do things you are like to know how to do but don't think you're very good at. And I am not going to, I want to see these mistakes because they show me you're on the path of pushing yourself to be better. There's a fantastic article. I can send it to you and you can post it, um, Chris, at G the GMS website. It's called, it's by John Cleese, Monty Python, dream, wonderful people. <laughs> you know, we like to laugh. But he wrote an article for Forbes Business called No More Mistakes and You're Through. And what he was attempting to do is flip the paradigm and pe help people understand in the business world, if, if they're challenging and doing things they've never done before, they're not all going to work. And he wants that kind of person. That's kind of improv as well. You know, I'm sure sometimes their stuff flopped the first time and Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail. Some, some jokes fall flat, sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you learn from that as well. So where I was coming from uh, is grit is developed by not having a fear of pushing your envelope and then screwing up. I mean, when Cody was 14, we were playing doubles in the men's B together, and he would swing fast and hit it out. I'd go, great swing. Dad, it was match point. I hit it out. Cody, it's men's B. It doesn't matter. <laughs> We're working on getting to the open level. And you can't be timid and just keep the ball in if you're going to be great. you got to go for it. So the other little thing, and this is just to Courtney as a teaching tool that she helped me here. One of the words to change so that we get more impact and the same amount of energy with kids is the word but mm -hmm. if we i can say you know chris that's a pretty cool color of blue you've got on but what's coming critique yeah the critique. the downside yeah <laughs> but and, and and you can't yeah. hear chris that i thought that that's a pretty color of blue you're waiting for the hammer or the whatever. All I'm asking you to do out there when you work with kids is change the word but to and. That's all. You know, Chris, that's a really cool color of shirt you've got on. And. You're not expecting a hammer. You're thinking, hmm, he probably wants to buy it from me or something. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, you're just not threatened. And, and we have this thought pattern that we don't realize as, as teachers of anything, when we want it, we care to instruct because we care because we're teachers, we say, this is great, this is great, but, and the kid doesn't hear, this is great, this is great. They only hear, but, and whatever's coming. So, Courtney didn't use it in that same way, you know, John, that was a great idea, but, but. But. She, she said, but, and I went, oh, there's a word. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. Word wanna, yeah. I want to help people minimize it. I still say, but I just, I want to minimize it and, and be conscious of when, if I say, and it'll help what I said, stay with them. And then they get better faster. It's all about, you know, training the brain. Yeah. And words matter. So, okay. So where were we? We're, we're on that second part was about technique. And, you know, I've had this talk a long time with your, with your dad is that I believe the vast majority of volleyball players know technique pretty quickly. They know the 
I, the, not the ideal, they know the general schema of what a form pass technique is or what a set technique is. And what I see at Olympic and at 10 year old level is simply being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I'm going to pick on old John Kessel again. When I was a young coach in the 70s, and I saw, this is, I think, the best example for me. I saw a kid hit it here. Now, technically, where should they hit it? Full extension, but they're spiking here. So here was young John Kessel. Reach. Get on top of the ball. Um, I was a pretty negative coach saying another word that I encourage you not to use much of, and that was don't. Don't drop your elbow. And my mom would came in and goes, you know, John, you're pretty negative in that there. You know, she was a first grade teacher. Um, can't you just say, keep your elbow up? And I went, got it, mom. Keep your elbow up. That's what I said after that, you know. And get on top of the ball. Now, it took me motor learning and some of your dad's wisdom to understand that if I take any kid and pull them out without the ball and say, show me what the technique we talk about here in GMS, what should you look like? And there's no ball. None of them will go like this. No, they're all going to go, oh, what the technique of spiking looks like? You know, they'll show you reach. Okay, where did you hit that last ball? This is called guided discovery. Where did you hit that last ball? Uh, kind of here, right? Yeah. And where should you hit it? Oh, I should be hitting it up here. So what do you need to do to get the ball to be hit up there? Well, I should reach. I said, well, if you reach on that ball, you're going to go like this, and then you're going to hit it off of your elbow. Why are you doing this? This why question they keep asking all the time. And as you guide them, they'll finally go, well, that's where the ball is. And I agree. You don't want to look like an idiot in front of your parents, your boyfriend, or whatever. You're going to put your hand on the ball. Not reach and hit it off your elbow and go, happy, I reached. <laughs> you know? That's like that. Hand on the ball. So you go, okay, so what do you need to do? Everything else being identical. What do you need to do on the next ball? If it was identical, what should you do? Hmm. Uh, hmm. And then sometimes you have to guide them a little more. Well, let, let's ask it this way. Should you go sooner, same time, or later? And they look at you and they go, sooner. And you go, yeah. And where will the ball be? Higher. Yeah. And what are you going to do technically? Reach. <laughs> Voila, go do it. And you just, you know, and that's a timing problem. That's not technical. But I... I kept saying reach and all these technical things when they just were in the wrong place at the wrong time and they're still kind of learning. And so I need to help them understand, are you late earlier on time? And in most kids developing reading skills, they're usually late. They're not too, I mean, some of them are early, they whiff, but that's much rarer to see a whiff than, you'd see, than to see this not full extension, which is simply, I'm a tiny bit late. So you can go sooner. What about swing your arm faster? What would where would the ball be? Higher. Da da. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I love that term of guided discovery. Yeah. And the, and the questions and. Yeah, it, it's slower, Court. It's yeah. slower learning, in the sense of, it takes one on one and takes time, but they become their own assistant coaches. We have an entire couple of generations of coach-controlled teams that err, and the next skill in their motor program is looking at the coach. Oh, no. You know, they screw up, and then they go, and the answer is always the coach going, blah, 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 when what you want is for them to be able to problem solve without you. And be cre more creative without you. I mean, that was one of your strengths, Courtney. You were, you pushed the envelope. You did things 
at a high speed, which is the, you know, people ask, what's the difference between Cody playing at Princeton and Cody playing on the men's national team? And the answer is speed. And that's it. Can you read at this next level of speed? And there's people that fall off the radar because they can't. They just can't do it. Yeah. So the, the high speed of the men and women's game at the top level in the world, at the world championships, it's you make a lot of timing errors. You make a lot of misjudgments. And, you know, you sit there and you watch Eric Soji get aced by a ball that is right, and you're going, okay, he only has about two tenths of a second to read this damn thing. <laughs> and human reaction time is about 1.450. If, if you're either going to be toast or not before the ball comes over the net. And it, to everybody here, I'm going to stay on that topic because it, it's one of the top 10 things I think we have to change in our sport in our country. The number one skill is reading. Reading a serve is really important. What Courtney is phenomenal at is reading her teammates' passes. Before they even have touched it, she's got all this experience saying, it's going over there. <laughs> and she's on her way there when a, a beginner would sit there and watch the ball hit their arms, go up, maybe even start to come down and go, oh, I'm supposed to go over there. <laughs> That's not very good reading. But it comes from seeing serve receivers. Well, yeah. if you want to win the serve serve receive war, this battle, you need to read serves coming over. So I've asked just about every libero, and I asked Misty, I remember, I've asked Karch, how much of your success, because you got to win the serve serve receive war, how much of your success happens on serve reception as a libero? happens before the ball breaks the plane of the net. And the men, because of jumpers, say 90, and the women, because of high-speed floaters, will say 80. Now, is there a scientific study of reaction time in your brain? No, I haven't seen it. I just ask people that have to do this. And they all say 80%. So 80% of my success at winning the serve serve receive war happens before the ball breaks the plane of the net. And what did I do as a young coach? I ran into the gym and I partner passed. And we never, the ball didn't go over the net. <laughs> you know, we, we, we got good at practice, but we didn't good at, to get good at performance. And it's not endemic to just volleyball. Most coaches practice so practice looks good and don't focus on the more chaotic kinds of practice that's ugly, like you heard in your gym for years chaotic ugly and then that transfers to better performance no we look good and we don't play well because i'm not training in reality to quote mark Dunphy. we got to yeah. train in reality you have to train in reality and we don't put up the net and so practice looks beautiful and life is good but you're not training in reality you're not getting that 80 to 90 percent that you got to get to be able to get, be good at a service team. Yeah. Pretty simple. John, talk about studies that haven't been done, but it feels like a, a corollary or principle that, you know, the number of times that the ball goes over the net in your practice is probably a high predictor of the skill that your team that is, is ultimately going to have. I, I totally agree. And, you know, we mentioned uh, there's a free PDF book that I wrote called Mini Volley. And it's about 100 pages. It's got a whole bunch of scoring things. It's it's mentioned in the course, and it, and it's free. And that, yeah, that reality of over-the-net experience caused me to, in the back of the book, there's a sign, an eight, eight and a half by 11 sign you put up in your gym. And it says simply, use of the court without use of the net is prohibited. <laughs> you know? And most coaches that's amazing they don't use the net they they look good but they haven't done what you just said as a study that's reality based i'm sure yeah. the more it goes over the net the better you get it playing volleyball over the net and it happens to go over the net on the first contact and the third contact all the time <laughs> <laughs>
That's great. You've kind of answered a few of the questions that were sent in, but um, Tony asked one about a pregame warmup. Now, of course, you don't always have the full court. So what are yeah, some no. things for like club and high school that would be good pre-match? Um, it, it, it's, there's a couple of great question. You can, I have parents in my club uh, understand this net so well that they got a ribbon and they hooked it to the net when we had our side and they stood at the divider net which stops the balls from going to the other court and they held it up and the kids did two versus zero under the ribbon. Or you can do three versus zero and you'll have four groups, not six, and it may be needed because of the space behind the end line. But if you're doing three versus zero, it's simply I serve, then I go over, I pass, then I go over, you know, I mean, yeah. all three of us go over and then all three of us come back. But we're moving. Hey, what a great warm up. You know, the better you get at Pepper, the less you move. What's that <laughs> about? You know, I mean, <laughs> I got a lot of t shirts idea, t shirt ideas out of this one. The great pepper players, you could nail their shoes to the floor. Oh, that's so funny. And they could probably do it. And of course, the weirdest part about pepper that I never understood was if I didn't hit it to you, what would I say as the hitter? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you apologize. <laughs> you apologize. <laughs> and in the game, which is what I'm preparing for, do I want to hit at the defender? Absolutely not. I never want to know how to hit at a defender. I want to hit in and away from the defender. So um, so when you put this ribbon up with the help of dad that holds it up for the five minutes that you're sharing the court or whatever, you know, people look at you a little crazy and stuff, but you're getting all your reps across the net. Yeah. That's that. one. The other way is called loser becomes the net or weave pepper. And in that game, that's the three of us. I'll be the net because I'm in the middle. And I hold my hands up. Chris serves over to you, Courtney. You pass, set, and hit to yourself. And the third pass to yourself, set to yourself, and then hit the third ball over the net. And it, as soon as some one of the two of you screws up, whoever screwed up becomes the net. Hmm. But my role is to be the net. And if you put it too close to me, I'm going to block you. Well, that's a lesson. Don't you know, keep the ball off the net. Don't hey, I like that. Too close. <laughs> and so, I, you know, and I'm warming up because I'm jumping so I can be a higher net because the net, you know, I'm going to jump up. So I'm warming up. And as soon as the ball is the floor, boom, the loser becomes a net. If you want to, you know, I've had some some school coaches go, well, that's kind of mean. The loser becomes a net. And I go, well, if you're comfortable with your kids, that's probably not a bad thing. But you can also say, winners stay on. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's, uh, I'm good with that too. Yeah. Oh, so those are great. Okay. Those are the two examples. And then the final one would be to, you know, do some sort of triple person pepper that you see the national team do well, but there's no net there and because they're cranking. But I like three person because I crank a long distance and then the dig goes halfway. That's what I want to get good at pepper in. And I want to go crank and dig it back to the spike, or that's death. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the two person one that I, we call, Lauren Anderson gave you this idea, we call it salt and pepper. So, Chris, you got, you're back to your men's team. Every player on the team digs the ball not so good, but either over the net perfectly or a little bit off the net. And you've got one player who digs the ball every single time up above him. Never misses the dig, but it digs it straight up. I'm going to put that kid on my team because yeah. I, can <laughs> I like that guy a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what tradition pepper teaches is to dig back to the spiker. And, and if I don't, I say, sorry. And I want kids whose only muscle movement, their own brain can only do one thing. Every ball that comes to me, I put it up in a cone around me that's about three meters or two meters round or something. Every ball goes there. It doesn't go to the center, but every ball goes up. So salt and pepper is just that. You That question for Tony about pepper, if, you, if I see a team 
salt and pepper, which means I crank it to you and you dig it up. And then you crank that dig up to yourself to me and I dig it up. And then I run to it and I crank it at you and I dig it up. If I had kids that only dug it up, I'm going that shit crazy because I'm going to win the transition points all the time because <laughs> yeah. Courtney's going to get to half of them and set this, <laughs> this perfect ball and we're going to go crush, you know? Yeah. It didn't I like the through. optimism there. It, it, it's a concept that we call, it's an article I call from positive to great, not perfection. I used to think perfection, but I learned the hard way that, you know, perfection's a problem. Yeah. So, I want you to be great. What is good in digging? Up I know. or over the net? They're both not to you, Courtney, but what would you rather have on a good team? Yeah. Every ball goes up on my side. No ball's ever going over the net. So that's called a negative error when it goes over the net and a positive error when it goes up on your side, but not to you. I want to teach positive first. Never experience negative and the same thing in spiking do i want to stand against the wall this is young john kessel letting all my kids stand against the wall and go ba -ba -ba -boom, ba -ba -ba -boom, ba -ba -boom, ba -ba -ba boom and the ball would just ricochet up and the boom would happen and oh god we're teaching hitting you know yeah and then you go into the game and the arm swing that they've learned is to hit the ball under the net not over the net so we go back to that question. Would I rather have a kid who hit every ball over the net, sometimes out of bounds, or over the net and into the net sometimes? I, I want to have not 12 kids who hit over the net all the time, <laughs> never into the net. Yeah. Because that, when you hit in the net, it's toast. It's, it's over. No, yeah. Nobody had, when you hit it out, they touch it. <laughs> Same thing in serving. If you, yeah. you have a kid that serves out long all the time and they, all the other kids serve in the net, I want the kid that hits it out long. I'm going to put her in one and say serve the, the opposite one over there and give her another two meters of booming and, you know. <laughs> Boom, baby. So. Uh, John, there's a question also from John. What's up, John Mayer? Good to see you. Uh, I had this question as well. You talked about reading at a high mm. level and how important that is. So obviously seeing the game as much as possible, creating these live over the net repetitions, mm -hmm. but are there other ways that you teach reading? Is there like explicit instruction you give? Well, that's a great question. And I think you may have experienced it with Karch. Um, I first as young John Kessel went bass backwards and I played blind volleyball. <laughs> and the, you know the thing and i covered it and then, i remember that on the net you should be like blasted and... yeah all of a sudden the ball comes over oh yeah and that was something that i thought was teaching reaction when i got if i'm a great coach i'm going to teach reading so it's the opposite and so karch i know did this with you which is they he would freeze jump servers at contact or maybe in before contact and then say where's the ball going oh yeah okay on so video that's how you do it without a video you get your 10 year olds you get your 12 year olds your 14 year olds to stand about a meter or so in front david cordis taught me this one i think they i you stand about a meter to a meter and a half in front of the server and they serve and you say either one through nine or one through six. And all you saw was the serve and the flight of the ball for one meter. And you say five, and then you turn around and see if you're right. <laughs> if you can get kids to understand that, you're so far ahead of the game in reading. Yeah. But what I did before is I taught reading when it started to come over the net. And that's too late. Yeah. <laughs> it's not it's similar. <laughs> it's similar to what you said about the, the hitting. It's mm -hmm. like there's the band-aid of it, or when we can coach at a higher level of see the game or understand, it's like you're getting to the actual symptom. Mm -hmm. And the more awareness they have, they can yeah. 
Okay. They can they can coach themselves without yeah. me. Yeah. I have a shirt. Maybe you should make a GMS one of these, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a shirt that says, um, are you learning on the back of the shirt? And the reason it says that is because to all of you listening tonight, if you have 12 kids and a nice two-hour practice, how much time can you give each kid on average? Not, easy, not tough math. 10 minutes is how much I can give every player one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, great. What learning are they doing during the other 110 minutes? that I'm not giving you attention. I'm paying attention to someone else or I'm helping. And that is how, when you get the kids to embrace the other 110 minutes and teach themselves without the look of the coach or the attention of the coach being needed, that's why it's on the back of my shirt. They look at me, I'm looking over here at you. <laughs> Are you learning? And I'm just saying, remember, you got to be learning when I'm not looking at you. And yeah, it's the 110 minutes. And if we get good during that, we're going to get, we're going to win a lot of games. <laughs> you know, We're going to be good. I love that. John, you said something earlier in our conversation about, hey, certain people don't like the term losers. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm really comfortable with that term because that's the reality. <laughs> you mm -hmm. lost. And, you know, and, uh, you know, loser is taking this negative connotation, certainly. But you just said, you know, I think if you have a good, uh, you know, rapport with the kids, you can say that or you've established this, you know, relationship. And for me, I think it's one of the things that you do best. And certainly, um, I guess, and, and you've talked about young John Kessel and maybe the more evolved John Kessel along the yeah, way. He's a, he's a good word. But for me, so much, <laughs> yeah, so much of the success, I think, if you're coaching young people, is is that you're able to create genuine, strong relationships with those young people. And I've seen coaches that aren't necessarily a very, very technically sound, maybe, yeah. or very technically accomplished as volleyball coaches, uh, you know, really maybe basic kind of stuff, but just love being around and being a part of young people's lives. And they're some of the most successful volleyball coaches that I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And are there any, is this something, do you feel like, you know, Hey, it's either in you or it's not, or are there things that you've yeah, consciously yeah. done or that kind of yeah. best practices that you see to create great relationships with young athletes. Well, you know, there's that, I think I learned it in the early 70s. Kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And in that same mini volleyball book is a two-page drawing of a volleyball player kind of in a blocking stance, front and back. And then probably 30 questions get asked so that you can discover who your kids are and what their favorite candy bar is and what their favorite room in the house is and why and what their favorite tv show is or what their favorite music is and what their favorite number is and all these things and i don't you know i just asked the ones i wanted to know about the kids as much as i could um and so i had the kids fill that out i'd be early. genuinely curious to hear what my daughter's answers to what's your favorite room in the house <laughs> <laughs> might be. Yeah. I, I know. I was like, oh, that's a good question. I've never. That's it. They're yeah. fun. They're fun. Yeah. And you get to learn the whys of each unique kid on your team. Um, uh, and, and so I collect that information in advance. Kiki, quiet. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on a podcast, dog. <laughs> um, so. With, with all the things that you can learn about your kids, um, there's a brand new book out. Uh, I can't remember. Set for Gold or something. It's by, um, it's by the, the son, Don, of the guys that worked with Doug's team in 84. And I can't remember the title, damn it. Sorry. But uh, maybe you can post it on the thing afterwards. It just came out. And 
what he did was he he helped is that the is if gold is our destiny yeah gold is our destiny thank you yep and he explains this learning about the whole person i i only know that 12 people every four years become a gold medalist in the olympics but 500 million people play volleyball and only 12 get that gold medal so when you think about it what all of us are doing at this lower level if you get a kid that rises up to where courtney did great and her, your high school coach was proud and mom and dad proud and, you know there's things that you're going wow she made it all the way to the top but underneath there were thousands of teammates at least hundreds of teammates of Courtney who didn't make it to this final level and i teach to develop leadership not to win matches i teach to make better humans and by doing this using volleyball as your tool it's pretty cool because they become ad's and they become fighter pilots and they, they become all these things that volleyball gave them this confidence but they didn't get to the best level of volleyball they didn't play in college you know what is it three percent going to college or something okay what are the uh, so i coach for the 97 percent, and that's i'm comfortable with that because i'm impacting kids and when i coach coaches thanks to things like this i'm impacting even more kids who are then going to be better in leadership and development and character and all those things that are that you know are part of what sport is supposed to do but it doesn't do it if you are losing kids so you know you mentioned being thrown into the abc hall of fame short story and the best storyteller just go listen to bill neville talk on anything and you'll be going wow i wish i was a better storyteller but good coaches tell good stories or tell stories because kids remember stories better than facts your mom and dad <clears throat> don't didn't put you to bed and say okay i'm gonna <laughs> read you some bedtime facts now no <laughs> they read you a bedtime story and you interpreted the meaning of that kind of thing so with with all these kind of pieces of the puzzle, um, you you just want to be a better storyteller. And I'll leave it at that because we 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 learn and remember things better when the coach weaves things into a story. And that's where Nev was, you know, phenomenal about so many things, and he still is. I we were talking about this book together. Beal, me, and and, uh, and Neville. But we're all talking to Shane, or Sean, or whatever who did the book. Um, Sean, talking, yeah, yeah, Sean. So I don't know. I, I, I think we just need to be better storytellers, and you'll be a stronger coach and connect better with your players for sure. Yeah. Well, John, John thank you. So oh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, Gord. I was just gonna say. Uh, you know, I think back to young Chris McGowan as an athlete and uh, just the influence that you had on me and the interactions that that I got to have with you uh, when I was playing for my dad, you know, and uh, yeah. when I was developing as a volleyball player. And it was it was incredibly meaningful for me. And athletics for me was always my safe space. Right. I just it was the place where I could go be myself with my teammates and mm -hmm. it's just, it's, I think it's one of the, for me anyway, one of the beautiful experiences of, of being a human is mm -hmm. to be part of a, part of a, an athletic team. And uh, it was really special for me when I was uh, part of those teams to have you be an influence on me. So mm -hmm. thanks. thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. Street for you and your dad. I will finish the story then. And that is <laughs> that I got inducted behind Chuck Irby and Peg Worthington. I think their records were like 900 and 200 and 800 and 300, you know? And then I was the third to speak and be inducted. And I said, well, my record is 10,220 and 37. 
and the crowd laughed. Your dad was there in the crowd, you know. And I said, you see, I have no idea how many matches I've won or lost as a coach. But I know the th names of all 37 kids who quit volleyball after I coached them. And to everybody listening here tonight, I'm just time together with the two of you. I think you're a phenomenal coach if you go zero and 30 and every kid plays volleyball the next year. I'm not so sure you're a very good coach if you go 30 and 0 and half the kids quit volleyball the, ne the next season. Hmm. We've got to, you know, we've got to keep kids playing because if one of the questions I, I, I asked the, had a big group of uh, kids in camp and I said, if you like volleyball and you're learning it, I taught them that and fly fishing, by the way, Chris. Those are the two things we did in camp. <laughs> Volleyball and fly fishing. Pretty nice camp, right? <laughs> um, I like that camp a lot. <laughs> I said, you know, there happens to be an age group in USA Volleyball for the 79 and over. So you have 60 more years to get better. <laughs> you know? it's, it's a lifetime sport. You don't stop playing just because you get out of high school. You keep playing, and that's one of the reasons why some of the things we put into these videos help kids work through a bad coach because of the experience they had with you when they were younger and they learned to love the game. And despite yeah. that not so good teacher that they're having, they're going to push through it to the next year where they hopefully are getting a better coach. So. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time. Chris, thanks. For all of you guys watching, um, you want to learn more. The videos will be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, incredible amount of information, way more than tonight, which was incredible. So we're really grateful, John. Thank you. For everyone joining us, thank you. Do you want to hit us up at a clinic? We got one coming up in South Florida, December 2nd through the 4th, and uh, we will see you shortly. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Chris.